So it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Brian Leroy as our colloquium speaker uh, for this afternoon. Uh, he received his uh, PhD in physics in 2003 from Harvard University. Uh, he's currently an associate professor of physics at the University of Arizona here. Uh, and his research uses a combination of scanning probe uh, microscopy, uh, optical spectroscopy, and electrical transport measurements to study low-dimensional systems. Uh, he's made uh, many important contributions to the study of two-dimensional electron gas systems, carbon nanotubes, and graphene. And today he's going to speak to us about imaging electronic properties of two-dimensional materials. And with that, let's join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Leroy. Hi, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come here and tell you about some of the work that uh, my group has been doing. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you uh, some of the things we're doing on low-dimensional materials. Uh, I guess it's all two-dimensional materials, I think, in the talk. Um, and so first I want to just tell you about the sort of different forms of materials. Uh, so let's just start with carbon. So in carbon, you have it, can be, it can be in many different forms. So here we have a three-dimensional form, which is the one that everyone is most familiar with, probably, which is graphite. And so if you take that graphite, you can also turn it into a two-dimensional form here, which is just one, lat one plane of this, and that's a graphene. But you're also able to make many other forms of, of carbon materials. You can take this two-dimensional sheet, and you can roll it up into a carbon nanotube. And I guess that's what uh, Shumit Mazumdar talked to you guys last week about some uh, physics in nanotubes. You can also, if you cut it properly here, you can roll it up into a little ball and make a zero-dimensional material, uh, a buckyball. So today, though, I want to concentrate on these two-dimensional forms of it uh, and talk about the two-dimensional form of carbon, so graphene, but I'll also tell you about other two-dimensional materials of the same sort of uh, basic variety that we can take three-dimensional crystals and turn them into two-dimensional uh, materials and what new physics we get in these materials, what new electronic properties, what new optical properties we get when we go down to a single two-dimensional uh, crystal. And so in graphene, I guess you probably are familiar uh, with graphene. Uh, we basically have a hexagonal lattice here of carbon atoms. So we have two inequivalent sites, A and B sites. And if you do go and calculate the band structure of this, you get this uh, dispersion relation. This is energy uh, vertically and momentum going horizontally. If I zoom in on one of these points here, that's called the Dirac point. And there we have this cone where we have the energy versus momentum relation given by E equals H bar VFK. And so we have a linear dispersion relation along this cone. So the energy is linearly related to the momentum uh, in the crystal. And so this should be contrasted with, say, a traditional semiconducting material, something like silicon or gallium arsenide, where you have an energy versus momentum relation, which is a parabola here. And so in graphene, we have this linear relationship. And so that's like a photon, right? The energy is just related uh, with some proportionality constant to the momentum. Uh, it turns out that this h bar vf uh, times k, uh, so the vf here and the c are basically the same thing. The Fermi velocity in the graphene is about 300 times less than the speed of light. So the particles in graphene are relativistic. They have very high velocity, uh, and they are linearly, uh, their momentum is linearly related to their energy. In a semiconductor here, there's the curvature of this band, and so we can define that with an effective mass. So that's related to the curvature of the band, second derivative of the energy with respect to momentum. And so here, depending on how curved this band is, the electrons effectively have higher or lower mass. They're easier or harder to move through the crystal. In graphene, since we have this linear relationship, the electrons are effectively massless in the material. And so what does this mean for electronic applications of graphene? Well, the first thing is because we don't have a, a band gap here, we can very easily go from the Fermi energy down here in the valence band uh, up here to ones in the conduction band. So we can go from N to P type just by changing the gate voltage, very small amounts here. And so we have an ambipolar type uh, material. So it can have either type of charge carrier in it. Uh, the disadvantage is that even here when we are at the neutral point, so we have no charge in the system, there's a finite minimum conductivity. So we can never actually turn off the graphene. It always is conducting electricity. So here's a graph of the conductivity minimum as a function of the mobility, so the quality of the graphene. And so even as you go to higher uh, mobility, higher quality samples, this minimum conductivity is pretty much constant uh, here. And it's some value uh, related to uh, E and H bar. And so for, if you want to use this for a logic type application, it's not very good. You can't make a very good transistor out of this. There's not an on and an off state. There's sort of an on state and a little bit less on state. And so for 
digital application is not very good, but you have a very high mobility. These values here are quite old now. This is uh, seven years old now. Now mobility values can easily reach a million, or not easily, but in the highest quality samples, you can reach about a million here, so several uh, orders of magnitude higher than this. And so there's uh, still promising applications in electronics. There's also promising optical applications. So graphene being just one single layer thick, uh, it's actually quite transparent. And so here what you see, this is a sheet of graphene on the right-hand side cut over a hole. So over here we have nothing. This is a single layer of graphene in the middle, and then this is a bilayer here. And if you look at the trans uh, transmission through here, you'll see there's 100% transmission through the open part. Okay, not, nothing unexpected there. The transmission drops by 2.3% when you have a single monolayer, 4.6% when you have two layers. And so basically the, the amount of absorption by the graphene is linearly related to the number of layers. And so as you increase the number of layers, the absorption goes up. And this is true over quite a wide uh, range of energies because we have this linear band structure. Uh, as you e change the energy of the light, you still have this 2.3% transmission. So you have over a wide uh, sort of spectrum up to a couple electron volts, you have this constant uh, 2% uh, transmission per layer, or absorption per layer. And so that means it's uh, good for a, something like a transparent conductor. Because I, I showed you on the previous slide that even a monolayer of graphene, we still had a finite amount of conductivity in it. And so you can have a very high conductivity, but a very transparent uh, system. So this is graphene in the shaded region and calculation. Uh, the blue points here are actual data. And you can see that can be compared with the red line here, which is indium tin oxide, which is a sort of uh, common transparent conductor. And it has a higher transmission at a given uh, resistance of the material. So it gives you a better uh, uh, transparent conductor. Uh, but uh, there's a whole wide range of other materials than graphene that can be uh, made into these two-dimensional systems. So show you graphene. We don't have a band gap. Uh, but it's a good transparent conductor. But if we wanted other materials, say if we wanted semiconductors, we can go to other materials. This here is molybdenum disulfide. Uh, so it's a si similar type of van der Waals structure. We have strong in-plane bonding, and the between layers is very weakly bound. So you can rip it apart and get to single monolayers. So over here, that may be hard to see, we have molybdenum disulfide. It has a direct band gap of about 1.8 or 1.9 electron volts. You can go molybdenum selenide, get 1.6. You can go to tungsten materials, get slightly different band gaps. And so there's this whole zoo of different materials you can use to have uh, whatever type of band gaps that you want in the materials. You can also get single layer uh, samples, which are metals. That's some over here, niobium selenide, niobium uh, selenide. Uh, you can also have insulators. This is hexagonal boron nitride here. So this is the same exact structure as graphene. Except instead of having all carbon atoms, we just have boron and nitrogen alternating. And so this is now ionically bound in the, in the layer, but still weakly bound uh, van der Waals between the layers. So you can get down to monolayer thicknesses of this as well. Uh, this is mica, another material which is easily peeled apart and made into thin layers. And so the, the point here is that there's just a huge zoo of materials that you can use to make uh, interesting new properties on these two-dimensional crystals. And so uh, unlike in graphene here, with molybdenum disulfide, we can make transistors. So this is a, a field effect transistor. The, the scales here, this is a logarithmic scale. So you can see now the current through the device changes by many orders of magnitude. Unlike the graphene, where maybe you can change the conductivity by a factor of three or four or five, here you can change it by five orders of magnitude or more. So you can really turn on and off and make uh, logic uh, applications in a single monolayer of a crystal. And because it's a single monolayer, it it's actually can be used in something like flexible electronics. So this is a transistor on here. Uh, this one actually is made of tungsten disulfide, uh, I believe. Uh, and the main point is that you can put it on here. You can bend it. It'll still do the normal transistor applications. Unlike a, a single crystal of silicon or something, if you take that, that's really a crystal. You try to bend silicon, it's going to just shatter. Here uh, we have the uh, material on a flexible substrate. You can bend it. You know, that's a fairly substantial uh, curvature there, and you still have the same sort of properties. Uh, these materials also undergo a transition from indirect band gap materials to direct band gap materials. And so that means that they, they have new applications in uh, 
sort of optical uh, applications. For example, this is molybdenum disulfide. This is photoluminescence on the uh, axis here as a function of energy. So these are crystals being excited with a green laser, I think 2.3 EV. In the bilayer case, it's an indirect band gap, so there's essentially no photoluminescence from the material. As you go down to the monolayer, it becomes a direct band gap, something like 1.8 EV, and there's an increase of about 10 to the 4 in the photoluminescence from the crystal as you go from two layers down to one. So as you, as you change the number of layers in these uh, systems, you have a huge changes in the electronic and optical properties. And so with this type of thing, you can imagine using different materials, which I showed you have different band gaps and create things like multi-junction solar cells, sensors which are sensitive at many different wavelengths. And what I want to actually tell you about today is mostly what happens when you start combining these materials together. So instead of just having a single layer of graphene, what if you start stacking graphene on other materials? And so these are essentially, we now have the ability to take any of these materials and put them on any of the other ones. And so you can think of it a little bit like Legos here. Uh, you take graphene, and I can stick it on a, a boron nitride substrate. I can stick graphene on a molybdenum disulfide substrate. So here's graphene on an insulator, graphene on a semiconductor. What happens when I do that? What happens to the electronic properties? But before I tell you about what happens to them, I need to tell you about how to make them. So the simplest way of making them uh, is with a technique called mechanical exfoliation, which is really just scotch tape. So you, you just take your crystal, you stick it on the piece of tape here, so that's a little piece of graphite on there. It starts off, it's maybe, uh, let's say it's 100 microns thick. You do it once, you peel it apart, now you have two of them. So each one went from 100, now they're both uh, 50 microns, you do it again, they're 25 microns, you do it a few more times and you get pretty thin. So you can see here, someone's done it uh, quite a few times. But you still probably don't have a monolayer on there. You still need to put it on a substrate and do one last peeling. So you stick it onto a silicon oxide substrate, you put it down, you peel the tape off, and then you hope that you've got a monolayer on there. So this works very well. You can get very nice, high quality crystals, but it's, you know, it's sort of grad students have to do it. It's not very good for application perspective. And maybe even the grad students will tell you maybe it's not so fun. Maybe it's better for undergrads to do. So the, the other way you can do this is something called chemical vapor deposition growth. And so here you basically need to come up with some substrate that you're working with and you can grow uh, the material on that. And so this is actually the case of graphene. Uh, you can take a copper substrate, put it in a furnace, you heat it up almost to the melting point of the copper, you put some carbon containing gas in there, and there will be form a, uh, a graphene layer on top of the, uh, top of the copper. You put a polymer on, dissolve the copper, and then you can transfer it onto whatever substrate you would like. And it's probably hard to see here, but there's a little bit darker region here. That's a flake of graphene on just a, a, a quartz window or something. Uh, so copper, there, there's a limiting reaction that it doesn't grow like a bulk graphite on the surface. So there's basically a diffusion process that keeps uh, keeping you just basically a monolayer or maybe two layers on there. You can do it on other metals. Nickel works as well. It's a little harder to control the growth conditions on nickel to get a monolayer. Uh, but it's, you know, and then the other materials like molybdenum disulfide, some of the other materials can also be grown not on copper but on uh, silicon oxide or other uh, materials. Uh, there was actually a new science paper last week growing graphene on germanium uh, where they can grow large single crystal domains. So there's nothing really that special about copper except it was the sort of easiest first one to do. It's, it's a cheap substrate to use. So once you've got these things, you need to actually have a way of actually seeing them, right? We're dealing with a one monolayer thick uh, material. I told you graphene has about a 2% absorption. Uh, how do you actually see that? And the way you see that is with a thin film interference effect. So we take a silicon substrate, so that's basically a mirror. We have an oxide layer on there, and the oxide layer is chosen to be a, a good thickness such that the uh, light that we get reflected off here, when you add in a, a single layer of your material here, you get a change in the optical contrast. And so you want to optimize the thickness of the oxide here so you can see the, the graphene layer on there. And so here, this is a picture of a graphene, a, a growth, a CVD grown graphene flake. So these are just alignment marks. The star-shaped thing is a monolayer of graphene. And you can see a little bilayer, trilayer, 
uh, probably four layers there. So you can see each different layer uh, changes the color slightly. It gets a little bit darker with each additional layer. And you can do the same thing with other materials. This is molybdenum disulfide here. So this is a relatively thin piece here. And then these are thicker pieces around here. This is hexagonal bronze nitride. So this is a flake of probably something 10 nanometer thick range. Here's graphene. This is a monolayer right here. I guess that's a bilayer and, and thicker ones around there. And so just by looking in the uh, optical microscope, nothing special here. This is just a standard optical microscope. We can identify the number of layers of the material. If you don't trust me that this is one layer or two layers, we can do a little bit better, and that's doing Raman spectroscopy. So here now we're going to excite the, the material with a green laser. So this is the case of graphene. We excite it with a green laser. We collect the reflected light. Some of the light that we excite uh, excites a phonon in the sample and then uh, comes back. And so it comes back at a slightly shifted wavelength for us. And so that gives a, a peak here at the G, what we call the G peak. There's also another process where we excite it and we have a two phonon process, one over to here, one back before the light comes back. If you do that, you get light coming back with about twice the uh, loss in energy. So it's about twice the shift here in wave numbers. That's the 2D peak. What I've shown here is three different thicknesses. White is one layer, yellow is two layers, uh, red is three layers. So you can see that the G peak grows as you increase the number of layers. That's basically just a marker of how much carbon there is in the system because the G peak corresponds to a carbon-carbon vibrational mode. So if I have three times as much carbon, this peak should be about three times as big. This 2D peak is this uh, two uh, phonon process. It changes quite dramatically between one layer and two layer. You can see it actually gets quite a bit weaker here. I won't go into the physics of that, but that's actually a way you can identify the number of layers. And if you look at the ratio of this peak uh, to this peak, uh, between the different number of layers, you get different ratios. And so you can identify the number of layers in graphene. You can play similar games in the other materials, uh, except you don't have the G and the 2D peak. They have their own phonon modes, so they have their own peaks that you can use to identify their thicknesses. And so most of the measurements I'm going to be telling you about today are done with uh, scanning tunneling microscopy in our lab. So these are opto uh, electronic uh, measurements. Uh, they're done at low temperature, so we operate at 4.5 Kelvin. They're done in ultra-high vacuum. And so the reason for these two uh, requirements, we want the low temperature for very good stability of the system. We want to freeze out all the vibrations. We want it to be a very stable system. We need to operate in ultra-high vacuum so that everything stays very clean. These measurements take 12 hours, some of them. We need to be able to stay in pretty good registry with our atomic lattice over that time. We don't want anything falling on the surface. We don't want uh, contamination or anything messing up the system. And so we want ultra-low pressure and fairly low temperature for these measurements. And so the way that scanning tunneling microscopy works is we have two different modes of operation. We have a topographic mode. So in this topographic mode, we have the tip of the uh, STM. We bring it very close to the sample, and we use a feedback circuit such that the current flowing between the tip and the sample remains constant. The current depends exponentially on the separation between the two. So any small changes in the height of the sample cause very large changes in the current. And so by using a feedback circuit, if we keep the current constant, that means we keep a constant height above the sample, and we just ride up and over any uh, sort of topographic variations in the sample. And so that gives us an image that looks something like this. And so here you can see this is a graphene lattice over some sort of bumpy surface underneath. The little hexagons here are the carbon, uh, the hexagons of the carbon, and then the overall topographic variation is coming from the underlying substrate. So that's a topography mode. We can also operate in a spectroscopic mode. So instead of scanning over the sample and measuring the height, uh, we go and we sit at one location. We turn off this feedback circuit that's keeping our current constant. And we just keep our tip at the fixed location. Now we change the voltage between the tip and the sample. And so you see here, the second part of the current depends on the density of states. So the number of states which are available for tunneling into. And it's an integral over those. If we, take, if we change the, the limit here and do a DIDV, then we get something that's proportional to the density of states. So that's just telling us how many states there are available for tunneling. And so here's an example of DIDV, density of states, is a function of voltage or energy. You can see here the states increase going away from either side here. 
And so in graphene, the spectroscopy is quite simple, actually. I showed you before graphene, the energy is proportional to h bar vfk. So we have a linear relation between the, the momentum and the energy. Oh, we lost an equation. Number of states in 2D uh, scales as k squared because it just scales as the area uh, in reciprocal space. And so if we combine those two together, uh, n goes as k squared. We stick in, then this goes in there, and then we calculate dn, de you get it's linearly related to the energy. And so the number of states, the density of states, just should scale linearly with energy. So we start here at zero energy, we have zero states, we should scale linearly upwards as a function of energy. And that's essentially what you see here uh, in graphene. The, the real power, though, in the STM actually comes from being able to combine these two different techniques. So we have this topographic technique, which I showed you before. We scan and we can see all, where all the atoms are in the sample, so that's what you see here. We can also measure this local density of states, which I showed you in the last slide. But now we can do that as a function of position in the sample. And what you'll notice is if I zoom in on these two spots here, we have some hexagonal pattern here. We have some other pattern here in the density of states. So these two have different uh, periodicities to them. So that means there's some different pattern in the density of states coming from some spatial variation, from some effect. This turns out to be scattering from defects in the sample. Here. And so we can combine these and get spatial information about the electronic properties in the sample by combining the topography with the spectroscopy information. All right, so now we'll come to the outline here of what I want to tell you about. So I want to tell you about four different projects in the lab, but I think I'll only probably end up having time to tell you about three of them. The first is what happens when you put graphene on an insulator. So this is graphene on boron nitride. So these two have essentially the same lattices. They're both hexagonal lattices, and you get interesting effects uh, to the band structure, the electronic properties of graphene when it's stuck on this insulator. Uh, the next one I want to tell you about is what happens when you put two different sheets of graphene on top of each other, but not just, uh, how, you, just how they would naturally occur, but you put them with different rotation angles between them. So there you get different... Uh, uh, absorption, essentially, optical absorption in there that depends on the rotation angle between them and also on the charge density. The next one I want to tell you about is when you have three layers of graphene on top of each other. Here, depending on how you stack the graphene, one can be a metal, the a different stacking can be a semiconductor, and we're actually able to tune uh, with an electric field from the two different stacking configurations by uh, dragging the boundary between them with our STM tip. And the last thing I will probably not tell you about is what happens when you put graphene on molybdenum disulfide. Uh, so one of these two-dimensional semiconductors, you end up seeing a whole series of new uh, states in the graphene on there. So let's start with graphene on an insulator. What happens when graphene is on hexagonal boron nitride? So first question you might have is, why the heck would you want to use hexagonal boron nitride underneath your graphene? And so all the original graphene work was done with graphene on a silicon oxide substrate. And the reason for doing that was, as I showed you before, there was this optical interference effect, thin film interference. You could just see the graphene on silicon oxide. So that was the substrate everyone wanted to work with because you could see the graphene and know that you had it there. The problem is that silicon oxide is not a very good substrate uh, material. There's a lot of uh, charged impurities in it. It's a very rough surface. We want to have something better than that. And hexagonal boron nitride, uh, because it's a material that you can cleave and, and separate with mechanical exfoliation, you can get atomically smooth surfaces. The bonding is basically all in plane, so there's no dangling bonds, no charge traps, and it's also a good insulator. It has a band gap of 5 EV or 6 EV. And so this was the first uh, work from Philip Kim and Jim Holmes group in Columbia. They saw when they put graphene on boron nitride, uh, it got much better... Uh, height variation, so the outer one is silicon oxide, the inner one is on boron nitride, and they also got much better uh, electrical measurements. And so we wanted to do the same sort of thing and look locally at what happens to the graphene on the boron nitride. But before doing that, you have to have some way of identifying your boron nitride, knowing how thick your flakes are uh, and how good they are uh, for the graphene. And so this is an optical contrast measurement. So here what we're doing is we're measuring the contrast so the difference in the brightness of the silicon oxide compared to the boron nitride normalized by the just the intensity of the light as a function of wavelength here. And so this is for different thicknesses of boron nitride. And also, as you change the wavelength of the light, you can see actually right here, 
Uh, if I start here at 600 nanometers, this boron nitride is darker than the surrounding silicon oxide substrate. As I change the wavelength down here, it becomes brighter than the substrate. So the optical contrast changes sign as I change the wavelength. And how bright and how dark it is depends on the thickness. So if we go and look here at somewhere like 530 nanometers, as I increase the thickness, it gets brighter and brighter, the contrast between the two. So that actually gives me a fairly easy way to identify how thick the sample is. I just use monochromatic light, uh, conveniently located at a green light uh, here, and I can tell how thick the boron nitride is. And to see that this works, uh, this is an image here of optical contrast of one flake uh, with green light, and I compare it to an atomic force microscope image, so where I get the actual heights of it, and I can see there's a very good one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of layers of boron nitride that I calculate from my optical contrast and what I actually measure with the atomic force microscope. So this means I can go and I can characterize my uh, boron nitride flakes, know how thick they are before doing the measurements. And so then the basic idea is we take our boron nitride flake or any other material that I want to have here. I'm going to then lay a sheet of graphene on top of that and make electrical contacts to that. So I have my device as a kind of a sandwich uh, stack structure. And then I'm going to come in with the STM and do the measurements uh, from the top on these structures. So the simplest measurement we can do with the STM is just this topography measurement. So I'm just measuring the height of the sample as a function of position. This is on boron nitride substrate. This is the equivalent measurement on a silicon oxide substrate. And you can see here we have a mountain range here, and we have a nice smooth uh, system here. So it turns out that we basically get an order of magnitude reduction in the roughness of the sample. So now the, the sample is you know, 10 times flatter. Uh, so the electrons that are traveling through the graphene you know, now can go on a nice flat substrate. We don't have to worry about these, uh, all these bumps and, and dips. And so that actually allows us to get very nice atomic resolution images. We no longer have this corrugation that we have to worry about. The sample is pretty much atomically flat, and we can go in and see now uh, the hexagonal carbon uh, lattice. So this is a, a zoom in. Uh, this is uh, about two nanometer image here. But now if I go and I zoom out a little, I see very different patterns. And so what you see here is two different uh, regions of the graphene on boron nitride flakes. The, uh, sh what I was showing you here, these little hexagonal lattices are the little tiny black spots in here. And so this is now a 20 nanometer image. So we've gone and zoomed out. And you can see there's a superstructure here. There's a moray pattern with a periodicity of something like one nanometer here. This one's a little bit longer, two nanometers. And this is coming from the fact that the graphene and the boron nitride have similar lattices, uh, but slightly different rotations between them. And so we have the graphene lattice here, shown here. This is the boron, uh, sorry, this is the boron nitride lattice. This is the graphene lattice. I put them on top of each other, but I put the graphene with a five degree rotation. And what you see is when you put it on with a rotation, you get this superstructure that forms. If I go and take the graphene lattice now and actually put it with a 10 degree rotation, so I turn it slightly more, now you can see this superstructure has a uh, shorter wavelength to it. And so depending on the rotation angle between the two uh, crystals, I have different uh, uh, moray patterns that form. And so it's, it's not too difficult to calculate what the wavelength that you'd expect of this moray pattern will be. It depends on the mismatch delta between the two lattices. So boron nitride has a 1.8% longer lattice than graphene. So it depends on that, and it depends on the rotation angle between the lattices. And so here's a few more images here uh, at different wavelengths, uh, at different rotation angles. So we can go up to something like about 13 or 14 nanometers as the longest possible moray pattern in this system. And that comes from the fact that there's this 1.8% mismatch. So even if I make this zero here, this angle, then I still have this delta here in the square root. So I can't get an infinite length pattern, but it's a maximum of about 14 nanometers. And so just by tuning the, the rotation, I have very different patterns can show up. All right, so that's the topography. But we can also do spectroscopy on the, the system and look at how, how uh, good the electronic properties are of the graphene on boron nitride. And so what I'm showing here in the color scale is the DIDV, so the density of states. So white is high density of states. Black is low density of states. And I'm showing it to you now as a function of gate voltage. So the gate voltage is underneath the silicon back gate. I'm putting a voltage on there, and it's a, basically acting as a parallel plate capacitor with the graphene, and it's inducing charge in the graphene. 
So that's shifting the Fermi energy, changing the doping in the, in the graphene as I change the gate voltage. And so what happens is I'm tracking here this minimum in the, in the DIDV, because that corresponds to the Dirac cone, the crossing point. And so you see this here moves as a function of uh, gate voltage. And the way it should move is, goes as the square root of the gate voltage. Uh, this alpha is basically the capacitance between the back gate and the graphene. And then the Fermi velocity shows up in front here. And so we can see, we can track the movement here of this thing. And it's exactly what you'd expect for the graphene material. But the reason I wanted to show you this was what, that there's the minimum here. And you can see as I change the charge density in the samples, I move left and right here, that minimum changes in energy. And so that allows us to actually go and be able to map the, the sample, to map changes in charge density in the sample. And so what we do is we go and repeat this measurement at different locations along the sample. We have this DIDV, we have this minimum showing up at a certain energy. If we then have different amount of charge over here at this point, it'll be shifted to the right. So it'll be N-doped or P-doped as a function of position in the sample. And so we can go map the variation in the sample. And that tells us something about the quality of the substrate that we're looking at. So if we do this measurement on silicon oxide, we see variations in the, the minimum of about 100 or 50 millielectron volts. So that tells us how much charge variation there is on the substrate. So there's a significant amount of charge variation on the substrate. If we compare that to Ambron nitride here, we have a nearly white uh, thing. There's a little bit of blue here, a little bit of red here. So the potential fluctuations, the charge fluctuations are reduced going on to the boron nitride. That's why if, if you do transport, electrical transport measurements on here, mobilities that you get on silicon oxide are about 10,000 or so, what I showed you earlier. On boron nitride, uh, you can get up to about 100,000 mobilities. So you get this reduction in this charge fluctuation, which leads to an increase in the mobility of the material. And so these are just histograms of that data showing the distributions. Silicon oxide, 55 MeV, boron nitride, order of magnitude better. So an order of magnitude improvement in electronic quality for the graphene on the boron nitride. So that was a fairly simple device I showed you. That was graphene on boron nitride. Now, uh, it's a couple of years later, we can make more complicated devices. Here's silicon oxide, graphite, boron nitride, graphene. So now we're stacking three different materials on top of each other. The idea here is that the silicon oxide is, is where all this charge uh, variation is coming from. Uh, graphite is basically a metal, so we're going to use that to screen out all the charge variation from the silicon oxide, and then we should get an improved uh, quality of our graphene. So now, this was what I showed you before, boron nitride on silicon oxide, so that's this data here. I've just changed the color scale, zoomed in, so now the red and blue show up. Now if I have this on when it's on a graphite gate, there's still basically no charge variation. So we have another order of magnitude improvement. The mobility on these type of devices is now up to about a million uh, centimeters squared per volt second. So it, it's very, very clean devices, uh, very high quality, and that's enabling new physics to appear in those uh, devices. Now, so that shows why people are interested in these, just boron nitride for just making better electronic devices, but also there's new, new effects appear when you have graphene on boron nitride. So I showed you before that we had these Moiré patterns. There's these wavelengths uh, that depend on the rotation angle between the crystal. And those Moiré patterns are coming because the electrons are experiencing a periodic potential. And so the periodic potential you can actually see showing up as the Moiré. If you had normal electrons that obey the Schrodinger equation, when you put electrons in a periodic potential, then you open a band gap, uh, basically wherever the wave vector of the potential connects two different points in the band structure. You get scattering there and you open a band gap. Uh, because these are Dirac particles, uh, you don't act, can't actually open a band gap with a potential. But instead, you take our normal Dirac point and instead you create these new super lattice Dirac points. So you create new Dirac points whenever the wave vector can connect k and, k, k and minus k together here. And so by changing the wave vector here, which means changing the Moiré wavelength, I change the energy where this occurs, and so I get new Dirac points at different energies in the, in the sample, just as a function of rotation angle. And so there was much work on what happens to graphene and periodic potentials. These are all theory papers here. Uh, but no one had a good way of creating a periodic potential until the boron nitride uh, came around to, as a sort of natural periodic potential for the graphene. Uh, 
So if you now calculate the density of states as a function of energy, at low energy you still have this linear increase, but now you have these new dips here. And those new dips are corresponding to these new Dirac points, right? Because at this point here, there are no states. So the density of states should go to zero at that particular energy. And so that's what you see here. The, energy, the density of states is going down, and it depends on the rotation angle, or it depends on the wavelength of the Moray pattern. And if we go in and we actually do our experiment where we do spectroscopy as a function for different uh, ones, we see these little dips here. This is a 9 nanometer, a 13 nanometer one. And so we see a dip in the density of states that's due to this super lattice potential. And to see it a little bit more clearly, this goes back to this DIDV as the color scale. This is the charge density, gave voltage, so I'm tuning the, the doping in the sample. This is my Dirac point, that's the minimum. But now there's a second minimum that moves just exactly in parallel with it, which is offset by about 0.2 electron volts from it. So maybe it's 0.3 electron volts. So that's for this 9 nanometer uh, Moray pattern. You can do the same thing for the different wavelengths and measure this offset. And you see they obey this 1 over wavelength dependence. And that's exactly what you'd expect for this energy going as the wave vector, because the wave vector goes as 1 over the wavelength. And so this is a sign that there's a new periodic potential creating new states in the graphene. So it's the first sort of example of being able to modify the band structure of graphene uh, through a, some sort of uh, uh, creating a heterostructure of different materials. All right, so now I want to tell you about what happens when you put graphene on top of another graphene sheet. So this is twisted bilayer graphene. So the idea is we have one graphene sheet, we stick another one on top, but we put them on top of each other with a rotation between them. So each one has its own Dirac cone, but now because they're rotated, the, the points where these cones are are in different spots in reciprocal space, and so they're separated from each other, and now there's this going to be a new Van Hoff singularity created here in between the two sets of Dirac cones. And so depending on how you change the rotation between them, you get new electronic and optical properties in the material. And so first, uh, let me just go back to this formula for this wavelength of this Moray pattern. Now the two lattices have the same uh, lattice constant. There's no mismatch delta between them. And so it turns out that the wavelength of the periodic potential now goes to infinity when they get exactly matched on top of each other. And so now, uh, unlike the boron nitride case where we stopped at about 15 nanometers, now we can actually make very, very long Moray patterns if we get these things aligned uh, very close together. And so we can go and identify the rotation angle in a flake here. This is a monolayer out here. This is a bilayer on top of it. So we go in here and measure with our STM. Uh, you can do some uh, Fourier transforms of your data to extract out what the wavelength, uh, you know, the wavelength of the Moray pattern is and therefore uh, what the rotation angle is between the sample. And so that rotation angle sets the separation between these two Dirac cones. So as you rotate them uh, more and more, the cones separate apart. And so that means that this point here and here, as you move them apart, it goes higher and higher in energy. And so this is a Van Hoff singularity that forms when these two cross each other. So we have a huge increase in the density of states there. And so the energy where that occurs depends on the rotation angle between the samples. And importantly, if you pick the right angle, you can have this match some optical transition. So we're doing Raman spectroscopy in this case. Uh, with a green laser. So we pick the rotation angle such that the transition from here to here matches our green laser, 2.3 electron volts. And when you do that, the Raman intensity, so the, basically the, uh, how much uh, scattering we get from the sample, is greatly enhanced. So this yellow curve is for monolayer graphene. This is the G peak, which I showed you before, which was a mark of how much carbon there was in the sample. I've actually enhanced it by 30 times here so that I could show it with what happens when you have the 12 degree rotation angle on there. So what we see is we actually see an enhancement in the absorption here of something like a factor of 100 in the graphene uh, when you have the uh, rotation angle. Uh, the, not the absorption, but you have an enhancement in the Raman signal of a factor of 100 when the laser matches this Van Hoff singularity here. And what's interesting though is what happens when you start doping the sample. So that was with uh, charge neutral graphene. So we had something, this was a 60 times enhancement of the signal for a 12 degree sample. Uh, if you now dope the sample, so I'm going to put charge carriers in, so I'm going to change where my Fermi level is on here. So right now it starts off here, I'm going to dope it into, say, the conduction or the valence band. 
When I do that with monolayer graphene, nothing happens to the Raman signal. It just stays exactly constant uh, because the transitions here are going from here to here. If you change the Fermi level slightly here, there's still carriers available. You can still have the transitions. But in these greatly enhanced ones, you can see there's actually quite a decrease starts occurring here uh, as you change the rotation, as you change the charge density in the sample. Uh, for some of them, it goes down. That's 11 and a half degrees. For this 12 and a half degrees, it actually goes up as you dope the sample. So there, you're becoming more, uh, a larger cross section for scattering as you increase the charge density. This one goes down and seems to sort of saturate around here. And so there's uh, tunable uh, Raman scattering, tunable absorption in the graphene uh, with charge density in here. And so what we think is basically happening is on the 12 degree sample, we have our green laser is on resonance with this Van Hoff singularity. We dope the sample, so we add charge here. That's changing the band structure of the graphene. It's changing slightly maybe the Fermi velocity, the slope of these cones, and it's taking us off resonance, and that's giving us a decrease in our signal. If you're slightly larger than 12 degrees, you start off off resonance at the beginning, but at some point as you put the charge in, you make it so that the green laser is on resonance, and so you get an increase in the absorption in the Raman signal as you change the rotation, as you change the charge density. And so that's why we see an increase at higher angles as we dope the sample. So by just changing the charge density in the sample, we're changing the, the band structure of it and then changing its optical properties. All right. So in the, this section of the talk, I want to tell you what happens in tri-layer graphene. So here we are in three layers of graphene. Uh, and so let me tell you first about what happens uh, as you add layers to the band structure. And so these are in the sort of traditional stacking. So here's the monolayer graphene, which I've been telling you about uh, so far, this linear dispersion relation. If I take graphene and take a second layer, so I have bilayer stacked, A, B. So that means I'm stacking the, uh, the so red here in one layer, the, the yellow is directly above it in the second layer. So they're, they're offset from each other, the two different lattice sites. If you do that, you actually go back to a more usual semiconducting type band structure. So you have this parabolic band structure which just touches at one point here. If you go to a, So this one you can introduce a gap if you apply now an electric field perpendicular to this. Uh, there's, you break the symmetry, so the, the potential is different on the top layer than the bottom layer, which then will open a gap in this configuration. In the third layer now, there's two different places I can put the third layer. I can put it directly above the first layer again, so that's ABA, or there's a third site that I can slide it over to, which is ABC stacked. And so these are the, the band structures for those two. The ABA stacked looks just like a combination of these two. The ABC stack is a little bit more complicated. It actually uh, goes as like K cubed here. Uh, and so the, the important thing is that there's two different uh, ways of doing this, and they have two different uh, electronic properties, uh, in particular in an electric field. And so to, to look at this, we want a sample that has trilayer graphene. So to do that, we need to do Raman spectroscopy. You can't actually see the graphene, so I just showed it in white here. We have a big blonde nitride flake. We got our graphene on here. You do Raman spectroscopy. This was a two-layer region. This is three layers. This is four layers up here. And in particular, the left-hand side was stacked this ABA configuration. The right-hand side is stacked ABC. And you can tell the difference just from the width of the, the 2D peak in the Raman spectroscopy. So we can tell which stacking we have on the two different sides. So now we want to go probe the two different sides, look at their electronic properties. So in ABA graphene, this was the band structure without electric field. This is ABC. Uh, okay, so there's a, sorry. Yeah, this is electric field zero, electric field zero. So these are the two band structures I showed you before. Now we apply an electric field to the sample. In ABA graphene, nothing much happens. There's no gap that can open. In ABC graphene, if you apply an electric field perpendicular sample, you open up a band gap here. And so you can see this in the spectroscopy measurements. Here's uh, changing the electric field as I go up here. In ABC graphene, we start off here and eventually we open a band gap here, a nice flat region in the density of states. So we're, we're, we're opening up a, a band gap, which is electric field tunable in this material. In ABA graphene, 
uh, you can see there's some peaks that move, but there's no real band gap that opens in here. So this one is staying metallic. This one is becoming a semiconductor as we apply an electric field to the sample. And so importantly, there's a region between the two stackings. And so we, to go from ABA graphene to ABC graphene, somehow we have to slide or move the, the lattices. And so there's a domain wall between them, uh, which is a soliton here. It's pinned at the two ends here, and it's free to move in the middle here. And so now we're going to go and actually investigate the electronic properties of this sample near this boundary region. Uh, so we're going to look at the pinned area and also in the free area. If I go look in the pinned area, this is density of states is the color scale as a function of position. Uh, we're doing this with a large electric field on the sample. So this is metallic everywhere. The red is the gapped region. So the, we have a gap here of something like 50 milli electron volts in the ABC region. Uh, and on the ABA, there, there's basically always conducting. And so in the pinned region, we kind of slowly go from one to the other. So it's kind of what you'd expect as you go over a domain wall. There's some boundary region where you, you sort of transition from one type of crystal to the other. It smoothly varies over something like 20 nanometers as the lattice stretches across there. In the middle, though, in this free region, we go, we have basically the same everywhere here, and we have an abrupt transition to the other crystal structure as we move across here. So as you scan across, you're in ABA stacked all the way to here, and then it abruptly changes, and now you're in the ABC stacked region. And this occurs over uh, essentially uh, a single pixel in the image, so very, very sharp, much sharper than any atomic uh, lattice. Uh, and so there's some sort of abrupt transition that's going through here. And now if we go and actually look at that as a function of the electric field that we apply, in the pinned region, nothing happens. It just That boundary is exactly uh, constant. In the free region, the, the boundary actually moves with electric field. And so what this is sh showing us, this is the ABA uh, region. This is the ABC region. As I apply a larger and larger electric field that's moving down here, the ABC region is growing compared to the ABA. So I'm turning this sample from mostly ABA into mostly ABC. I'm converting it from a metallic to a semiconducting sample. I'm changing the crystal structure of the material uh, just with the electric field here. And so you can see that it's the electric field that's controlling this because it's moving as a function of electric field in either direction across here. And so essentially what's happening is I'm taking my STM tip. There's an electric field underneath it. I'm coming to this domain wall. And then I'm pulling the domain wall with me as I scan from the right to the left here. And it's like a rubber band. I'm pulling along the middle. As I stretch it out, it, it gets more and more energy. At some point, it, it snaps and comes back. And that's why I see this abrupt transition from one stacking to the other. If I scan the other way, as I come near it, at some point it gets attracted to the tip. And then I scan with it all the way over to the other side. And so essentially, you can model this as contributions from three different terms. One is an elastic term, so stretching the rubber band as I pull across. There's a van der Waals attraction between the tip and the domain wall. And then there's an electronic energy gain that I get by opening up a band gap in the system. So it, in the ABC sample, as I open a band gap, I push down the energy of a set of states. So that lowers the energy of the sample by opening the gap there. In the ABA sample, it stays metallic. There's no change in energy. And so that's why at large electric fields, it favors being the ABC stack because this electronic energy uh, st gets lowered by going to the semiconducting sample. But I can't pull it an infinite distance because of this elastic term here. As I pull it further and further, the rubber band gets more and more stretched. This elastic term grows with D. That's the amount I've pulled it. And so the competition between these two determines where this boundary uh, shows up in the sample. All right, so I think I have just a couple minutes. I will go through what happens when you put graphene on a semiconductor. So I showed you at the beginning of the slide, there's a whole range of these two-dimensional semiconductors like molybdenum disulfide, tungsten diselenide, tungsten disulfide, um, molybdenum diselenide. And so these are uh, sort of direct band gap semiconductors. If I measure the, the drain source current as a function of the voltage here, when they're turned off, I get nothing, and then I, I have a semiconducting type behavior. And just like the graphene, we can identify them with Raman spectroscopy. So here's the Raman uh, shift, and there's two little peaks here. And the, those peaks, the location of them determines the number of layers. 
So we can go identify one layer, two layer, three layer. And then we're going to put the graphene on top of that uh, and look at what happens to the device. And so here's a picture of the device. So we have silicon oxide substrate. Then we have molybdenum disulfide flake here. And then we have a graphene flake on top of that. And then we make source and drain contacts to that uh, to do the transport and STM measurements. So if you just do a normal transport measurement here, measure conductivity as a function of charge density in the sample. Uh, if you're in the holes, so the P-doped region, you have just normal graphene behavior because you're in the band gap of the molybdenum disulfide. The molybdenum disulfide is turned off. It's basically not doing anything in the sample. And so you just have normal graphene behavior. As you tune to the positive side, eventually the molybdenum disulfide starts conducting. And so you get electrons in it. And that leads to a saturation in the conductivity here. And actually, it goes slightly downward. Uh, as you try to put more and more charge in the sample, you get worse conductivity, so negative compressibility. So you have a device here where you have the transport behavior is in the graphene at one type of charge density and in the molybdenum disulfide in the other. So you can kind of change the, the type of charge carriers you have in the device just with the gate voltage. Now, from an STM point of view, once again, we have to worry about what happens to the alignment between these two. So molybdenum disulfide is also a hexagonal uh, crystal. You've, you've got it on top of the graphene. There's going to be a moiré pattern. Same story as what happens with boron nitride or with graphene. But now this mismatch, this delta between them is enormous. There's something like a 25 or 30 percent difference in lattice constants between the two materials. So. Uh, this is something that naturally you probably could not grow or anything, but if you just put them on top, uh, the two systems will, will, can accommodate that kind of difference in lattice constant. What that means is the moiré pattern you get is very short. It can't be longer than about 0.8 nanometers. So it, unlike the graphene on graphene or graphene on boron nitride where you can really tune it, here it's basically always a very small number. And so then you can go and look at these uh, Fourier transforms of the topography. And there's a whole series of little dots here. Uh, you can go and identify them all. The ones out here in red are from the graphene. The ones in yellow are coming from the uh, moiré pattern between the uh, molybdenum disulfide and the graphene. And then these are replicas out here. And so there's a, quite a large uh, series of peaks in here, two different rotation angles. Uh, and so that's telling us there's, uh, quite, there's a pretty good interaction between the substrate the, and the graphene. Now if we go and look at the DIDV as a function of gate voltage, uh, we can see here there's the minimum in the conductivity or in the density of states from the graphene going like the normal graphene. Normally this would continue down like this if it was graphene by itself. But instead as we get to the positive, the, the uh, electron doped region, everything is just basically flat here. And that's because we're no longer able to change the charge density in the graphene once the molybdenum disulfide starts conducting. So once there's charge carriers in the molybdenum disulfide, it's keeping the graphene at whatever chemical potential it was at. There's no longer any doping in there. Uh, what you'll also notice on here, if I look here, there's all these little bumps in this density of states. So this is density of states as a function of voltage. This is the Dirac point, And we have all these other additional features showing up here. If I take a derivative of the data, this is the Dirac point coming here, and there's all these other little states here. So there's a whole plethora of new states forming, uh, presumably due to the interaction between the graphene and the molybdenum disulfide. So there's quite a bit to explore still in this system uh, to try to understand the origin of all these new states and what's happening in this heterostructure. So let me, uh, do, before concluding, just actually acknowledge everyone who does the work. Uh, so in my group, uh, Chang and Matt, uh, the PhD students who did most of the work, Chang did the optical work on graphene on graphene. Matt did the STM, uh, some of the boron nitride stuff, all of the trilayer and um, molybdenum disulfide. Uh, John Min was a previous student who did some of the work on boron nitride. Uh, we have lots of collaborators who provide samples and uh, theoretical support. And so in conclusion, I showed you today what happens when you put graphene on boron nitride. You create new Dirac points. You change the band structure of the graphene. Uh, you essentially can engineer new states in the graphene with its interaction with boron nitride. When you have two layers of graphene, but you put a twist between them, you get enhanced Raman signals at particular uh, energies. And you can change their, their strength with charge density.
in three layers of graphene, the electric field can actually change the crystal structure. You can go from a semiconductor or a metallic sample to a semiconducting sample uh, by just changing the electric field in the sample. And then there's uh, new sets of states are flying when you start doing interactions of graphene with molybdenum disulfide. And thank you for your attention.